Number 9. Three Cosmic Messages, Second Quarter, 2023. Daniel Duda. Lesson number 9, A City Called Confusion, and a quarter on the three cosmic messages. Dr. Daniel Duda is our moderator. Our opening prayer will be by Karen. Dearest Father God, source of all wisdom and wonder, communication, creativity, and mercy and majesty, love and light, we pause in your peaceful presence and just settle down to listen to you, to learn from you, and to grow to love you more. It's completely beyond wonder that you, the Father of the universe, just bend down so close in love to connect with us, to live in us, and to be all around us always. And may our hearts and minds be open to growing with you today as we begin this journey through your word from all across the globe. And may we listen for your voice in the quietness of wherever we are. Speak to us, please, through messages that are clear or complex or mysterious or metaphorical, just as you spoke to John 2,000 years ago. And we pray a special blessing on our brother Daniel, who's walked a little ahead of us on our journey of exploration today, so that he can guide us on this adventure with you. And at the end of today's journey, may the thoughts that we have shared together expand each of our experience of you. And may they open our windows a little wider on our understanding of your indescribable love for each one of us. We hardly have the words to say how much we love you, so we are glad that you can read the messages on our silent, wondering, and grateful hearts, which say far more than anything we can ever express in merely human words. But still we say with all our heart, we love you, Father God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. So with this lesson, we move to Second Angel's message. Second Angel's message is the shortest of all. It's just one verse. If you look under number one, the lesson gives you the statement of purpose. And it says, in this week's lesson, we will study these two women of Revelation. The one clothed with the sun in Revelation 12, and the one dressed in scarlet in Revelation 17. And probe more deeply the conflict between truth and error. Yeah. What makes it probing it more deeply? The memory text gives you the conclusion of the whole matter. So, if you look under number two, the second angel's message is developed and expanded further in chapters 17 and 18. And the memory text is taken from Revelation 17 and speaks about these people who are making war with the Lamb. But of course, they are not going to be victorious. But the Lamb will overcome them because he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So he gives him these imperial titles. And those who are found to be on Lamb's side are the ones who are called, chosen, and faithful. And notice those who are on the other side were also called. They were also chosen. But they decided to spur that and became unfaithful. And that made void of their calling and being chosen, because we are all chosen for eternal life. Nobody is chosen for destruction. If you look under lesson outline, the headings for each day, you already see in which direction it's going to go. So it's a study along the dogmatic lines. So depending where is your headquarters, where is your registration card or baptismal certificate that determines whether you are in Babylon or in part of the remnant. And if you look at the read for this week's study, you have Revelation 17, Revelation 18, one text from Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus gives the authority to Peter and other disciples. In Greek, it's plural. Then there is a text about idols of Babylon from Jeremiah 50 and the text from Psalm 115. The lesson says that we are going to study the two women in Revelation, but the text is about the fall of Babylon. So, Terry, can you read Revelation 14, verse 8, which is the second angel's message? Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay. Now, the best way to misunderstand something in the Bible that almost guarantees misunderstanding is to start with Revelation. So if you want to know what the fall of Babylon means, you cannot start with Revelation. You have to start elsewhere. 
probably as a way of introduction, we need to say that we already established that in the previous lessons, that the three angels' messages are one message. They are just given through three messengers. Okay, so there are not three different messages. And that's why also in English language, you know, I have done my share of translating for people from the GC or the division. In English language, you have this grammatical anomaly that when you say third angel's message, you don't mean third, you mean three. You just use third to mean all three. And quickly, you need to learn that as a translator, that the speaker doesn't mean the third one. He means all three. But biblically, they are just one message given through different messengers. And we established with the first angel's message that it's good news, that it's evangelion. That is eternal gospel. And it's important to know because euangelion in classical Greek literature was used for announcement of victory. So remember the battle at Marathon, the guy who was running the marathon, the long distance, he came with euangelion, which was we won. It was about the death of the enemy, if that was a good news, or the birth of the Roman Caesar. So there is this famous statement, the birth of Augustus is the beginning of Evangelion, the good news, because he brings Pax Romana, he brings peace, and that is for everybody. And you can understand the mindset of the birth of Jesus. I proclaim to you the good news that will be for everybody, but it's a different kind of peace that Jesus brings. So you are almost for sure going to misunderstand the second angel's message if you don't realize that the words fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great are not original. They are just a quotation from Isaiah. And when the message was given the first time, the Babylon is fallen, it was great news. It was good news. Because for the Jewish exiles, it means you can go home again. To paraphrase the title of Jack Provencia's book, that's what it means. You can go home again. It's good news. So let's read Isaiah 21.9. Look, there they come, riders, horsemen in pairs. Then he responded, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods lie shattered on the ground. So day after day, in verse 6, And the Lord said to me, Go post a lookout and report what you see. Day after day, verse 8, My Lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stand at my post. But there is no good news. And then in verse 9, the good news finally come. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And the images of its gods, the one that have received the credit for destroying Jerusalem, to whom they all bow down and acknowledge that their victory comes from them, now they are lying down, shattered on the ground. They have been unmasked as the ones that do not have the power. And let's read Jeremiah 51, because Revelation is going to use Jeremiah 51 as antitypical fulfillment of what happened with the ancient Babylon. So, Jeremiah 51, verses 6 to 8. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Save your lives, each of you. Do not perish because of her guilt, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He is repaying her what is due. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine, and so the nations went mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and is shattered. Wail for her. Bring balm for her wound. Perhaps she may be healed. So it starts, the message starts in Jeremiah 50, and there you have... 46 verses, there is a prophecy about the fall of Babylon, that people will go under the gates, and then you have 58 verses in chapter 51. So there is a lengthy prophecy against Babylon, and once again, it reminds you that when the message was given, it's the good news. The oppressing power that kept you in captivity is no more. You can return back home. And you know what's the surprising thing? If you read Ezra and Nehemiah, and 90% of people did not care. The business was going well. The holy dollar, I mean the pound, the euro or whatever, the shekel was bringing good results. Why would you risk 
going back. And so only 10% of population are going to hear the voice. And no Levites, because they don't have any territory assigned to them. They live from the tithe. And they are not so sure that people in those that land that was full of destruction are going to pay the tithe. So they stay with their businesses there in Babylon. They are not even returning. So Ezra discovers when they set out on the journey that they are going to restore the temple and rebuild the temple and don't have anyone Levites to serve in the temple. So he sends messengers back and entreats with them and say, guys, we can't fulfill our mission if you are not coming. So could you please come and join us in this endeavor? 90% of people stay back. They are happy, settled there in Babylon. Which, of course, is an interesting perspective because Revelation 14 says, I saw another angel flying in the midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth and the live is those sitting on the earth. So those who are tied to the earth, so who are happy where they are. They are not looking for any change. Bob Ziprick. Why would Babylon be the metaphor for evil when the Israelites or Jews were treated relatively well there compared to, say, Nineveh, maybe Egypt, maybe by the Philistines. And maybe there's no explanation, but it does seem like, as you were just saying, they actually were treated maybe relatively well there compared to some other empires. And you know, I've wondered, because that always seems to be the metaphor, that's the symbol of evil. And yet, it may not have been the most evil place they ever lived. In Isaiah, Egypt also doesn't have good press. So Egypt is the one that becomes the anti-kingdom in Genesis, at the end of Genesis and Exodus. And then it's treated like that in the pre-exilic prophets. Now, Assyria is a symbol of oppression. And Nahum has a lot to say and says that once Assyria is finished as a superpower, that the nations will stand and clap and rejoice and be happy that the superpower is gone. But because it was Babylon who took Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and the city, it serves as the symbol of this anti-kingdom that continues. But of course, you had other anti-kingdom powers, godless powers who fight against God. And of course, in the book of Revelation, it becomes the symbol of the Roman dominion and all other powers that exalt themselves against God. Iris? It's interesting that in Daniel, Babylon is on top. It is the golden head. (laughs) And it stands basically for this absolute power that does not tolerate anything else beside it. I think We have this rich story of King Nebuchadnezzar, who exalted himself to a degree, and God gave him a warning. And he said, you know what? Either you turn around, or you're going to be with the animals. The book of Daniel, I think, is very helpful in understanding this terrorizing or this power that doesn't tolerate anything else beside it. And I think this is what Revelation plays on. Either... God is on his throne, or we have a power that has rejected God being on his throne, and we are exalting self, human power, and there's no space for God. And I think in this end time scenario, this godless power that has drunken the wine of the blood of the saints, so that violence is associated with any kingdom where there's no place for God and where self is exalted. Human power gets drunk on violence. And that is a threat to the children of God. That power is so real. And what we see here in the second message, and I thought that was so beautiful how you pointed that out. This is a hopeful message that that power that is so real right now is gone in a second when God makes it be gone, you know. So something that God's people know that they cannot stand against it, that they cannot fight it, that they cannot eliminate it, that power is broken by God. Yep, excellent. And we will go there in a second. We'll start with Genesis and then we'll go to Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, because you are not going to understand what the fall of Babylon means if you don't go to the Old Testament roots of it. 
Okay, so let's go to the place where Babylon is mentioned for the first time. In Hebrew Bible, if you want to understand something, you need to find the place where it's mentioned the first time, which of course is Genesis 11. So we are going to read first nine verses. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people. And they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Okay, so the whole world was of one language and common speech, so finally you got the unity that Christ prayed for, that everybody was thinking the same, and behold, it's not a good thing. So in Genesis 1, you start with chaos, and you end with order and rest, the Shabbat. And now you start with order, the whole earth is of one language and the same words, and you end up with chaos. Therefore, the place was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth there, verse 9. So starts with unity ends in chaos. The significant transition is that you start with the physical chaos in chapter 1, and you end up with moral chaos in chapter 11. Now, where is Babylon? Geographically, where are we? Verse 2, and people moved eastward. Have you heard this before? Yes. The Garden of Eden was planted in the east in chapter 2, verse 8. In verse 14, you learn about the Tigris River, east of Assyria. When the cherubim are placed at the garden, at the gate, in chapter 3, 24, they prevent their return at the east of the garden. In chapter 4, Cain goes east of Eden to the land of Nod. And so when people go eastward and settle for human habitation, what do you expect? Do you expect something positive or something negative? Do you expect a blessing or do you expect a disaster before you get beyond verse 2? Yes, as Harry says, going east is moving away from God. And notice the problem is not so much that they built an urban development. The purpose is, verse 4 They said, come, let us, have you heard this before? Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So, so far in Genesis, the names were given by superior to inferior. And now they want to get name for themselves. It's not only a desire for reputation, for superiority, but it's autonomy. Nobody is going to tell us what to do. And of course, that was what got Adam and Eve into trouble in chapter 3. Now, when God creates humanity in verse 1, he tells them, fill the earth, verse 28. And then after the flood, God repeats the same in chapter 9, verse 1, to Adam and his sons, that they should fill the earth. Now, these people decide against that command because they don't want to be scattered. And they use the language of come let us, which is a clear indication to 126, let us create humanity. God says, let us create men and women so that they can fill the earth. Now, you already know, if you read chapter 10, the table of nations, that people are going to fill the earth. So there will be 70 nations, but you don't know how they get there. And here you learn that they get there because of what God does. And of course, don't miss the humor there in the Bible. So they say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. And so the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. 
they build it so high that they hope to reach to heaven. And God says, I need to come down and have a look at it because from here, from where I am, I can't see it very well. You know? So that gives you the humorous side of it. And of course, the important thing is that God does not destroy the tower because the tower is not the problem. Tower is only symptomatic of the way of thinking, the Babylonian way of thinking. So what is Babylon in Genesis 11, Iris? It's humanity's declaration of independence. Yes. We don't need you. We are sufficient in and of ourselves. We got it covered, God. Just let us do our thing. And as Graham would say, and notice it's people who believe in God and believe in power because they are building. It's not the wicked people in the sense, the unbelievers, and it's not people who doubt God's power because they are building the tower to survive the next flood. It's interesting that when God says there will be flood, people don't believe it. And when God says there will be no more flood, people don't believe it and build the tower. Okay. And when Paul goes on his missionary journeys, the greatest trouble for him is the believers. It's not the unbelievers. And so here are the believers who are building the tower because they don't trust God. Patrick? Yeah, and I just thought, just on the back of what you just said, the ones who believed Jesus' words that he would be resurrected were those who were against him. They're the ones that tried to keep him in the grave. But that was what I was going to say. I think Babylon as well, uh, it is a declaration of independence, is also the setting up of hierarchies of people. This, I think, comes through quite strongly. God says, I want you to spread out. They say, we're going to stay together. When you have people grouping together, you're going to have hierarchies. And that's when things start going wrong. And that's why God had to spread them out a little bit so that those hierarchies would be dissipated, at least for a, a little while longer. And the result is that those who wanted to make a name for themselves, truly, indeed, they get the name, but the name is Babel. So what starts as a gate of God ends as a confusion. So if you look under number seven, the lesson is, if you ridicule or persecute those who have different opinion, we are following the footsteps of Babylon. When we use power to uphold our understanding of truth, if we persecute those with different opinion, we are Babylonians. We follow the footsteps of Babylon. Dan Kido? One of the reasons why I think maybe God wanted people to spread out, going back to our last lesson, is that when you spread out, you eliminate hierarchy. But more than that, you're sort of forced to think for yourself. I think that's one of the probably great benefits to a more agricultural way of living is that farmers need to think for themselves. They need to be more in tune with the weather and other things like that. While in a more urban setting, you're always looking for other people to help you reach answers instead of trying to come to those answers yourself and using your own mind in a more independent fashion. So I think there might have been some benefit in preventing people from getting into trouble by this God's desire for them to spread out. Okay, thank you. Olivius? Maybe just to continue that thought, in Genesis 1, he said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, over the land, right? Put them in the garden to plant it and to keep it. So maybe another purpose for them to spread out is the earth needed to be maintained. And so there's a functional aspect of spreading out as well. Thank you. Sean? How is this action described in verse 7, uh, chapter 11? Come, let us go down and their confused language. How is this action considered consistent with who we know God to be without demonstrating his arbitrariness at this point? How is this not an arbitrary action that does not reflect consistently with his overall character? So how is it not? Yes, I see a God who is meddling here, somebody who meddles so as not to allow the consequences of their own choices to play out. But notice, is he meddling because he feels threatened? Because he's afraid that, wow, these people are going to do something that threatens my position, my authority? Of course not. The story is very clear. One does not have to be threatened. Being threatened is not the only instigation for potential meddling, which could indeed play itself out as coming across as somebody who still is meddling. Sure. Who's who is still arbitrary. It's not only a threat to one's authority that would instigate that. It seems to be a bit inconsistent in terms of who I know God to be with respect to cause and effect. Sure, but God is meddling in the flood just to show that use of power is not going to solve the problem. And so once again, God is meddling to show that this is not the way, the Babylonian way is not the way to achieve 
If you look at the stories of Genesis, all previous acts when God interfered, there was a mitigation with some kind of measure of grace. So Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. He tells them, you don't understand what happened today. You have no clue. So he sends the cherubims to escort them behind the gate, but they are not dead. They do not die. On the contrary, they receive garments to cover their nakedness. Cain is expelled to live the life of a vagabond. He's going to be running in chapter 4, verse 12, but he receives a mark to protect him from vengeance. The earth is destroyed by water, but there is a grace because God remembered Noah and told him to build the ark, and so whoever is inside the ark is saved. Now, where is grace in the story of Babel? Where do you find mitigation? Where do you find the grace? Iris? I believe that had God not meddled or mitigated here or interfered, humanity would have very quickly done itself in with violence in that space. That's just the nature of godless human beings. The power abuse is just the natural consequence, and out of that comes violence. So I think with spreading them out, I think you mentioned 70 nations. You had almost like a natural experiment. <laughs> so you had basically 70 nations trying to figure out how to live well. And I think some cultures we see embedded, I think probably God has tried to find access to all of these cultures through their conscience, speaking to their heart. And the closer they get to figuring out good and evil, what is good, what is conducive to growing human relationships and a society, then you have better cultures. And where they were completely bent on violence, I think they eventually did themselves in. Yes. But where is the element of grace in the story? I think it Babel. prolonged to spread them out, gave them more opportunity to try different ways of living and building societies. And I think then creating cultures and in each culture, God tried to reach them again. So I think there is an element of grace to prevent self-destruction imploding. Okay. It's a good answer. It's just not a biblical answer, but it's a very good answer. <laughs> Let's go to Livius. Okay, so maybe this is just like Iris's comment, maybe, but I think the grace is in the confusion of language in that it prevents the spread of lies. It cuts down the spread of lies. So maybe I think the grace is in that. That's my answer to that. But then also with the comment of the flood and it's specifically Babel here, God is also trying to keep avenue for the Messiah to come because he made a promise to Adam and Eve back in chapter three that someone's going to bruise this serpent's head. So I think also God is working to also keep the avenue for Jesus to come. Sure, sure. But you have the deteriorating situation after the fall. You have the deteriorating situation starts with Cain and culminates in the flood. And then God says, I need to do something. So you have his meddling or interference, which is a form of judgment. And the judgment has positive and negative consequences. So for those who are in the ark, they are saved. For those who are outside, they drown and they don't drown because God hates them, or those who are saved are not saved because they are the only ones that God loves. It's because God says, if you are inside, you are saved. If the water gets into your lungs, you can't survive. Now, with Genesis 11, once again, we get a deteriorating situation. And God says, I need to do something about it. So he comes down to sea, and he confuses the languages. That's the negative judgment. And where is the positive judgment? The first remnant in the Bible is Noah. And Noah was the one who remained. There is the word, the remnant. And his family was the only one who remained from all humanity. So he's the first remnant. Where is the remnant of the Genesis 11 story? Aaron... I'm not sure what the remnant is of the Tower of Babel story. Okay, don't forget what you wanted to say. So let me suggest, look a little bit broader. Don't look at 11, 1 to 9. Look a little bit broader. Where is the remnant of the story of Babel? Abraham? Abraham. Abraham 12. Because he was Abraham. that land, right? Yes. So the next remnant is going to be Abraham. And the call of Abraham is the call to be a blessing. That's where the grace of God is manifested. Okay, but you wanted to say something else. Yeah, it's interesting that God sends a flood basically to speed up the process of what mankind was already doing. They were already headed for self-destruction. 
And so God speeds up the process on that in grace to minimize human suffering and also make a way for the Messiah to come through the seed of Noah. And then like you mentioned, Abraham, but then they try to undo the flood, right? Cause there was cities before the flood. And then after the flood, they're like, we're going to make a city that can withstand a flood. So they're trying to undo the flood. And so I thought that was interesting. Okay. Bob, you get to a kind of interesting question of the purpose of the languages, because later you have Pentecost, and God then reaches across to give access to all these languages. And look at all the trouble we have now with the translations of the Bible and everything between languages. Wouldn't it have been easier to just have one language, then we wouldn't have to study in colleges and things, all these different foreign languages. You just have unity of communication. So I don't know. I realize in the hereafter, we'll probably have some discussions on why it was an advantage to have many languages. And also we've ended up with just a few dominant languages in the end. There's many little languages that have died out somewhat. There's some that are down to three or four speakers, and yet we have probably, you know, even in Pineal, we have how many languages do we work with? There are major languages in the whole world that are what do you call the lingua franca, you know, French and Spanish and English and certain Chinese ones. Anyway, just a thought. Yep. Gary, I saw his hand. He knew that Abraham is the remnant of the story. That was, that was my point. I mean, that was what I was sort of referring to. I thought it was interesting that the Tower of Babel experience was to disperse the people throughout the world. But yet, the next person he called to try and fulfill his purpose came out of Ur. And if my geography is right, Ur is not very far away from Babylon or Babel. So he didn't go very far away from, he didn't go to the edge of the dispersion. He went to the center of this event, and that's where he found the person that he wanted to use from there for. Yep, thank you. Larry? The idea of where is the grace and what happened at the Tower of Babel. Peter, I think, is the one that says that God protected you from the consequences of your stupid ideas so that you could come to salvation or something similar to that. Okay, thank you. Michael? Bob touched on something I think is important. The reason that the Roman church didn't want the Bible translated into common languages is to keep it from being corrupted. For example, if you look at Shakespeare's plays, you can read them today, but you need a commentary to figure out what he was trying to say. And what we hopefully have today is a good translation of what was originally Greek and Hebrew. Yep. Thank you. Aaron. Human nature, and God knew this, is to make a king like many nations. And Israel's like, we want to be like the other nations later, right? And so if they all spoke one language, it would be easier to have one king. And if there's one bad king, that's really bad for the people. So that's one more way of God showing his mercy. Yep. And that's why after six weeks after Exodus, he gathers them at Sinai and speaks to everybody. That's why he put 70 elders in charge of Israel, so that Moses does not become the new Pharaoh. That's why he uses 12 judges in the book of Judges. And when they say we want a king, like all other nations, he says, not a good idea, not a good idea. And so part of Babylonian hierarchy, as we discussed in the previous lesson, is that somebody is going to tell you what you are supposed to believe. And your job is not to question, but to comply. And God says, it does not reflect the character of who I am. That's not the best way to run the society. You can run an anthill that way, but not the human society. Okay, let's go to Daniel 3. What do we learn about Babylonian mentality in Daniel 3? King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So everybody who was somebody had to be there. Verse 3, listen what you haven't known yet. So the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, 
You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Okay, and in case you didn't get it, let's read verse 7. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay, what's going on? You know the story. What's going on? How is the author trying to create a rhythm that tells you about what's going on here? Repeated use of the same words and phrases over and over again. Yep. And you have to submit. You don't need to think. You just hear the signal. And at the signal, you execute the command. So what is it that you learn about Babylon in Daniel 3? Michael? Blind obedience. It has nothing to do with faith. It has to do with following the commands of the chief of state, regardless of one's point of view is. And which was for faith followers, such as were the Hebrews at the time, that was a difficult, difficult message. Yeah, thank you. And Patrick? Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. On thinking, obedience is the most important thing. Emphasize. And what Revelation is going to tell us is that God is not a celestial virgin of Nebuchadnezzar, who says, when I give the signal, it brings me pleasure if I see you falling down blind compliance. And notice at the end of the story, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His attitude toward them changed because here is somebody who dares to be different. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. He doesn't care about the commands, about the soldiers of his army. He throws them there. Verse 22, the command was so urgent, so unthinking, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers. But he doesn't care because people are not important. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace with their robes and trousers and turbans and all other clothes. Once again, it's there. And the shoes and the socks. And verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, well, there are three men that we tied up and threw into the fire. They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men and they are walking unbound, unharmed. And what I can't understand, the fourth is like a son of the gods and God is in their midst and God communes with them, not with me. Can you believe it? What's the message? Larry. Well, this is not the message, but the thing that I noticed here is the same similarity between the fury and the rage of Nebuchadnezzar and the fury and the rage of the dragon and the people that follow the dragon in Revelation is right. that they lose their capacity for reason with the amount of rage that they have. And how does Revelation say that? Not sure. The Babylon made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. It created an altered sense of reality. They're on a cuckoo land. They don't operate on evidence-based reality. Karen? I was just thinking about the cruel power of the king who just wants to destroy people and doesn't care about them and people don't matter and how that creates a worship experience if it is such produced by fear. But perfect love, God's love, takes away all the fear and creates a space for us to worship that's just safe and loving and filled with grace and just how different it is to be in that space and to be invited into a choice of space rather than being forced into worshipping in such a cruel way. So notice Babylon uses the power and you become drunk with the power. And the only thing you can then think about is compliance. You need to do what I say because I said so. And Revelation warns you, if you are so obsessed with power, if you are so obsessed with compliance, you lose all sense of reality and you are going to be deceived. So Babylon pretends to be God's city. People believe it. They are united. And then they discover that it's going to sting them like a serpent because that's exactly what the proverb says about drunkenness is going to do to you. Then you wake up and the reality is different than it was in your mind. 
Bob? How close did Nebuchadnezzar come to having a conversion experience like Saul on the road to Tarsus? They both had a dramatic experience. And sometimes you wonder how close Babylon came to being a converted country, a new Israel that would send out missionaries itself. I mean, the king was sort of converted more than once. Later on, he went insane and then he repented again. You wonder, I mean, we won't know till the hereafter, but it does seem like there was conversion experience gradually encountered by Nebuchadnezzar. I'll stop there because I'm speculating, but it does seem like it's in the Bible, so it's a true story. Sure. And you can read in Daniel 3, verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, approached the opening of the furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Mijag, and Abednego, come out, come here. And so they came, they obeyed. And verse 27, and satraps and perfects and governors and royal advisors all crowded around them and inspected them. And the Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Mijak, and Abednego, who sent his angel. And therefore I decree that people of any nation and language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Mijak, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. So once again, using his power, to make sure that everybody serves the right God. And what is it that is going to get him in chapter 4? What is it going to bring him to the senses? What kind of manifestation of power? The Jew of heaven and living next to the animals and a vegetarian diet, eating grass. Suddenly no more power, just living with the evidence and reflecting on that and pondering it over a period of time. Patrick? Being blinded or drunk on power, perhaps this connects with what we were talking about in the previous lesson, part of the whole thing with the Sabbath, because for six days God was showing his power, and then on the seventh day he stopped using his power so that we would notice his character and not just his power. And I think that's an important counterbalance to, yeah, what Babylon's doing. Amen. So well said. Thank you, Patrick. Larry? I've worked around people who were rageaholics, and it's amazing when we reflect on it, and this lesson made me do that, the power that a rageaholic has over everyone around him. You have strong-willed people who, in the face of uncontrolled rage, because of the shock of it, will do things that they normally wouldn't do. And I think that's part of what becomes so traumatic about the Babylon experience is this uncontrolled rage that Lucifer has against Christ. And I think Graham Maxwell frequently alludes to this about he was so outrageously insane that he suggested that, hey, you know, maybe you should just bow down and worship me, isn't it time? And see what happens in Revelation 13 and 14. You have the rage that some people dare to be different. And that's why they need to be brought into compliance. And yet they are the ones who stand with the Lamb and say, we are not going to be intimidated by this. Because we know that the name of the Father is on their forehead. We know the character. This is not from God because God does not work like this. If you have to retort to fear and create a distorted sense of reality and manipulate into compliance, then it's not the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of God. You are in the services of some other power and it's the dragon. And so that's the lesson from Genesis 11. When we try to reach heaven by our effort, when we build our identity on our achievements, look how good we are. Look how many people we have baptized. It's not the proof that we are on God's side. It's just the proof that we follow the footsteps of Babylon. And if we persecute those who have different opinion than us, then we follow the footsteps of Babylon. If we use power to uphold the right understanding of truth, because we do it for their benefit, We follow the footsteps of Babylon. And that's why when you read in Revelation, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's the good news. Because it tells you, yes, the system is broken. Don't expect the solution from the institution. The solution cannot come up from the institution. Because the institutions work in their self-preservation. And they are going to use their power to submit non-compliance, to oppress different thinking. And that's their downfall, because God doesn't work like that. He gave us the Sabbath. Take time apart. Take time to reflect. Come to see what is your individual contribution. Come to see what you can do as a community, how you can be different. See the potential. 
God does not come down to destroy the tower because he is full of rage and he needs to take away their toy. The tower is not the problem. It's the Babylonian way of thinking that this is going to create a name for you, that this is the way to reach heaven, that this is the way to achieve your goals. So yes, Jesus gives authority to the church, read Matthew 16, but read it with Revelation 17, that if you start abusing that authority, then you are not God's church, then you are in the services of dragon. All right, Adam. We have three kinds of wine that I'm thinking of. We have the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And there's a verse that says, for the law works wrath. Like the idea that we can just impose laws on people, it does not bring happiness or peace or good to the world. But the wine that Jesus offered is the wine of betrothal. And he said, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. To invite God and his life into you is totally different than having mere laws forced upon you by government or by a church. And so that thought occurred to me. And then also there's another wine in Revelation that says the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, speaking of God, but it's a totally different kind of wrath than the wine of the wrath of her fornication because the wrath of Babylon is imposed, whereas in Romans 1, we read about the wrath of God is revealed in him letting go. Okay, thank you. So let's go to Revelation 18.4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, and so that you do not share in her plagues. So come out of Babylon, my people. What does he tell you, Patrick? His people are in Babylon. Yep. That God loves Babylonians. That God cares about people in Babylon. So make sure when you preach the second angel's message that it's good news and that you are included. Because it's about them, then something is wrong. Because it's one message, it's eternal gospel, just given through different messengers. And the majority of God's people are still in Babylon. And because he loves them, he sends the message to them. He says, guys, we need to embark on a journey of getting out of Babylon. We need to embark on this journey of getting rid of the Babylonian mentality, way of thinking, because it's going to make you drunk. It's going to make you live not an evidence-based life, but out of reality. And you end up deceived that when you wake up, you are in a different end station than you expected. Iris? I think this is a hopeful message in that there are still people in Babylon who hear. Jesus says, my sheep will hear my voice. And those that are not his sheep will not hear his voice. They have chosen not to hear anymore. But the hopeful part is at this stage, there are still people waiting to hear Jesus' voice and to change sides and to follow the Lamb. And so I think that is a hopeful message because once that is no longer the case, I think then Jesus can really come because it wouldn't make a difference anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Michael? The reason that the Seventh-day Adventist Church developed in this country, as well as other religions in this country, is because of the First Amendment to the Constitution. In Germany, Northern Germany is predominantly Lutheran. Southern Germany, Bavaria, is predominantly Catholic. Why? Because those were the official religions. That's why. And Christianity in the United States today is under assault, whether it's because of Dobbs versus Planned Parenthood, which overruled Rule versus Wade, or other issues. Churches are under assault for their beliefs, not because of their political views, but because of their Christian beliefs. And I'm reminded of the words of Thomas Jefferson, that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. I know that's not the subject of this meeting today, but I think it's time for us all to be aware. If you're a Christian, you're under assault. But that's nothing new. That's the history of Christianity. Yep. So the Latin phrase, cuius regio eius religio, who has the power determines the religion, determines what people are supposed to believe. And if you don't comply, if you don't go along with it, then you suffer the consequences. So what does it mean to come out of Babylon? How is it good news? 
Because when the first time the message was preached, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, people stood up and clapped and rejoiced. It was good news. So when the message is preached as a second angel's message, it needs to be the good news message, the everlasting gospel that helps people to follow the Lamb. It cannot be about somebody's bad guy. You better be at least like me, because you are on the wrong side, if that's how you understand it. So what does it mean to come out of Babylon? Can we unpack that? Let's go to Patrick. I think one thing it means is that we should be on the forefront of those who stand up for equal rights for everybody, no matter what, whether it's between men and women, abled and disabled, black and white, because we're all equal in God's sight. There should be nobody ruling over, nobody forcing the conscience of anybody else. The church should be the place that's known for holding up the equality of everyone. Because otherwise, if we keep having these hierarchies, then we're just as bad as Babylon. Yeah, thank you. And remember the fountains of the water. Let's include the environment there as well. If we are the ones who believe the worse, the better, the sooner we destroy the planet, the sooner the second coming comes, then remember Revelation says God is going to destroy those who destroyed his planet. Because he's the creator of it all. And he's the creator of, of us all. And so coming out of Babylon must be coming out of these Babylonian patterns of thinking, which are based on power, which are based on hierarchy, which are based on blind compliance. You do it because I said so, Iris? Uh, I'm going to try another bold move and you can correct me if it's off. <laughs> I wonder if this is kind of a similar situation like in the Garden of Eden, where Satan cast doubt that God had Adam and Eve's best interest in mind. And I think the same mudslinger shows up in Revelation. And it is really the trustworthiness and the character of God that is here at stake. There are two models. There is one model where God is not trustworthy and we have to take things into our own hand. And that can even mean we're creating a good world, but we have no need of God. And here's the invitation to reject the lie and to believe that God is truly trustworthy, that he deserves to be worshipped because he's God. He is the only one who is worthy to be worshipped. And it's an invitation to reject the lie, embrace the truth about God, who he is, and worship him and follow him and trust him wherever he leads. Thank you. And why is this so serious? Why is this so important? As we read in Revelation 18, so that you do not share in Babylon's sins, so that you do not receive Babylon's plagues, because her sins are piled up to heaven, and she will receive what she was given. Why is this so important? Sherry? Part of the discouraging part is that the devil is so clever in changing how people perceive reality and creating a false narrative, a false reality, and then adding in all of the issues of the drugs and the other ways that people can distort their thinking. It becomes very difficult to reach people with the good news when their minds are distorted in that way. And not everybody can rise above that to hear good news and may just automatically lump what you're saying as bad news or irrelevant because of the distortions in their thinking. Yeah, and that's back to Genesis 3. Be careful which story you believe, because the serpent influenced Eve seriously enough that she's convinced that God is not on her side and that this story needs to be lived and it has far-reaching consequences. So why is this so important? It's important because of what we read in Revelation 18.24, because God will tell us in advance where this Babylonian way of thinking, where it leads. Revelation 18.24. And in you was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. And in you, in Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of Jesus Christ, who was killed by Babylon, because for John, Babylon is a code name for Rome. And what was the beginning of the story? The one who is dragon was the shining one, the bearer of light. And he just raised the question, are you sure that God is what you think that he is? Because I sit with him in the committee and he's not what you think he is. And the bearer of light becomes the king of Babylon. 
and the result of the Babylon mentality brings violence, shed blood, and the values that are the values of God's character cannot be promoted. And we are back to Genesis 6, and everything that human thinking produced was about violence and hurting other human beings. And that's why God says, be careful how you are thinking, because it creates a stupor. It creates altered sense of reality. And it's not anymore evidence-based. It's based on this distorted thinking that power, position, will achieve it, or because you are right, you have the right to impose it on everybody else. And that will not bring you the desired outcome. And the third angel's message will follow and show that if you deviate in certain things, just one inch, when you shoot the rocket, it will end up outside of New Jerusalem. It will bring the conclusion that you did not expect. And that's why these matters are important. How you understand fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Livius? Yeah, so Nebuchadnezzar's decree is actually a reality. He makes that decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. It's just a false picture of God. Yep, yeah, we are going to use violence so yeah. that you serve the right God. Yeah. And Revelation warns you, it's not going to produce the desired outcome. That's not the way to achieve it. It just creates more violence, more hatred, more rebellion, more defiance. That's not the way to go. All right, Larry. The peace that you get from understanding God is a peace that I've never had in my life. And that to me is why it's so unbelievably important. Yes. So let me conclude on number 10. There is this story about Albert Einstein. He had IQ of 150, that he had this cat that was disturbing him from his calculations and work. And so he had an opening, a hole made into his door so that the cat could go through and he doesn't need it to get up from his desk and open the door and let the cat in. And so he could stay at his desk, work on his calculations and theories, and the cat would go in and the cat would go out. And then the story goes when the cat had the kittens, he put a small door, a small opening next to the big one so that the kitten can get through as well. And that's IQ 150, and that you and I can't even aspire to. And so the scientists tell you, you know, to measure intelligence is a very complex thing. And that's why when we try to measure intelligence, we don't measure intelligence. We come with something that's called the intelligence quotient. It's a number that, yeah... If you have ever done an intelligent text, you will have a battery of variety of tasks. So you take a cube with dots and then you move it. Do you have the abstract thinking? What is the word that is missing here? Or which word does not belong into this row of words? Because it has different types of intelligence, the way how you are thinking, because it's a complex thing. Maybe we should say that there is a Babylonian quotient. It's a complex thing, this Babylonian mentality. What is your Babylonian quotient? What is the Babylonian quotient of your local church or the global church? Because we are all there. And the message is, come out of her, my people, because Babylon is fallen. And you can constantly keep coming out of that because it's good news. And it needs to be the good news even today. Michael? Your comment about... Einstein's cat made me think of the fact that near the end of his life, he was at Princeton University working fruitlessly, as it turned out, trying to find a unity theory that unified the four great forces in the universe. And he could get three of them in an equation, but he couldn't figure out how to put gravity into it. And he was visited by Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was a Danish poet, a Nobel laureate. And he was explaining it to Niels Bohr, and finally Bohr said, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. And I'm afraid oftentimes with my prayers to God, I am telling God what to do. All right. So can you see how something that started so promising as the gate of gods that will help us to reach the horizons and vistas that we don't know can become the confusion and the source of drunkenness? of living with a distorted sense of reality. But the good news is that God says, come out of her, my people. Because God's people are in Babylon. He still loves them. He warns them that the Babylon is fallen, that he does not need to have the power over them. 
that you can make choices that will bring you closer to God and away from Babylonian thinking. And it's a journey on which we are all invited. It's a community journey. We need one another. Because as Sherry mentioned, our capacity to process depends on a number of things. And sometimes just the kindness of someone else who can come close, come alongside, put the arms around you and help you see things and process things that you would not be able to process alone can be the nudge that you and I need and how we can bless one another. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we are so thankful that although we all live in this confusion on this planet and we are partakers of this Babylonian mentality, that you have not given up on us, on everybody else on this planet, and that you still will have followers who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And today we would like to tell you that we want to be in that number. We want to be in that crowd. We want to be that type of community. Forgive us then when we use our power, our position, our sense of being right to impose things on other people that distort them, their thinking, and their picture of who you are. And help us in coming days and weeks to be more inspired by who you are and how you work so that the power and persuasion of love rather than the love of power would be what motivates us or other people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.